Thank you all for joining us this morning for NCFAR's Leadership Latte and Learn. Uh, today, we're very glad to have USDA's leaders in research, education, and economics joining us to, so we can learn more about USDA's research community and the important work that they're doing to advance climate smart agriculture and nutrition security, among many other important topics. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I'm Sarah Olhurst. I'm Chief Science Policy Officer with the American Society for Nutrition. ASN is a member of the National Coalition for Food and Agricultural Research. We're a nonprofit organization with nutrition researchers and scientists. And I'm pleased to be a co-chair of NCFAR's Research Outreach Committee. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with NCFAR, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, consensus based, and customer led coalition that brings together food, agriculture, nutrition, conservation, and natural resource stakeholders to serve as a forum and a unified voice supporting increased federal investment in USDA's research, education, and economics. Over the years, NCFAR has hosted tens of thousands of attendees at hundreds of seminars and webinars. Um, the Lunch and Learn series and now our Latte and Learn series are really NCFAR's signature events. And the goal of these events is to educate and empower staff on Capitol Hill and policy stakeholders about the value of public investment in food and agricultural research. These uh, webinars that we have feature experts from institutions across the country sharing their expertise on a wide range of topics. Um, we've done these in person and now we've moved to the virtual format during the pandemic, which has really allowed us to have a broader reach. And today we're very pleased to have the Leadership Latte and Learn feature, featuring USDA's REE leaders. And so our first speaker, which I will introduce, is Dr. Shavanda Jacobs-Young, who is the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, and also the Chief Scientist at USDA. Dr. Jacobs-Young um, oversees the REE mission area, which is comprised of more than 8,500 employees with a $4 billion budget across its five component organizations, including the Agricultural Research Service, the Economic Research Service, the National Agricultural Statistics Service, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and the Office of the Chief Scientist. And we are so lucky to have individuals representing each of these components with us this morning. Together, these organizations advance agricultural research, innovation, data, and extension across a full range of agricultural issues, including climate smart agriculture, nutrition security, equity, and strengthening the food supply chain. As the chief scientist, Dr. Jacobs Young advises the Secretary of Agriculture and other senior officials on scientific matters and chairs USDA Science Council, which convenes all parts of USDA scientific enterprise. Prior to being appointed by President Biden to serve as the REE Undersecretary, Dr. Jacob Jung was Administrator for ARS from 2014 to 2022. And so NCFAR has a longstanding relationship with Dr. Jacob Jung, and we've always been so pleased with the work that she does. Prior to that role, she served as the ARS Associate Administrator for National Programs, leading the research objectives of the entire agency. She also led the Office of International Research Programs, which is responsible for ARS's liaison with its international partners. From 2009 to 2012, Dr. Jacob Jung served as the inaugural OCS director, where she was responsible for facilitating the coordination of scientific leadership across the department to ensure the research supported by and scientific advice provided to the department and external stakeholders were held to the highest standards of intellectual rigor and scientific integrity. She has also served as the acting director for NEPA and as a senior policy analyst for agriculture in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. 
She holds her MS and PhD degrees in wood and paper science and a BS degree in pulp and paper science and technology from North Carolina State University. She's a graduate of American University's Key Executive Leadership and Public Policy Implementation Program and a proud fellow of both the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Academy of Public Administration. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will let Dr. Shavonda Jacobson introduce the other speakers when it gets to uh, their time. And I just wanted to mention before we kick things off that we are recording today's presentations and these will be posted afterwards on ncfar.org. And also at any point during today's presentations, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we will have time at the end for questions. And so now I will turn things over to you, Dr. Jacob John. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for having us today. Good morning to everyone who took time out of their busy schedules to join us. As Sarah said, I am proudly the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics um, at the Department of Agriculture, and I serve in the capacity um, as USDA Chief Scientist as well. Today, I am so delighted that I am joined by the leaders of each of the agencies in REE, and we will um, save just enough time. We're going we're gonna to go through our presentations, and we're going to save enough time for Q&A. And so please, as Sarah said, please put your questions in the Q&A, and we look forward to engaging with you. So today I'm gonna to kick us off by sharing um, our research, education and economics updates and some of the exciting work underway in REE. Our REE agency leaders will provide brief overviews of activities happening in their organizations. And we plan for plenty of time, as I said, for discussion with you all. So simply said, the research, education and economics mission area of USDA or REE is, as we fondly call it, is the driving force behind USDA science mission. USDA is a science informed and based organization. We have federal leadership responsibility for advancing scientific knowledge related to agriculture. At REE, we are dedicated to creating a safe, sustainable, affordable, and competitive U.S. food and fiber system, as well as supporting strong communities, families, and youth through integrated research, analysis, and education. We accomplish this through five component organizations. The Agricultural Research Service is the largest intramural research agency of USDA and delivers scientific solutions to national and global agricultural challenges. The Economic Research Service anticipates trends and emerging issues in agriculture, food, the environment, and rural America, and conducts high quality, objective economic research to inform and enhance public and private decision making. The National Agriculture Statistics Service provides timely, accurate, and useful statistics in service to U.S. agriculture. NASA administers the Census of Agriculture, conducted every five years. The Census of Agriculture tells the story and shows the value of U.S. agriculture. The National Institute of Food and Agriculture invests in and advances agriculture research, education, and extension to help solve national, and ch national challenges in agriculture, food, the environment, and communities and the Office of the Chief Scientist provides scientific leadership and ensures USDA funded research is held to the highest standards of intellectual rigor and scientific integrity. The work we do every day in REE is vital to USDA's overall mission and to the agriculture in general. We couldn't carry out our mission without strong leadership. So here is our leadership team. Dr. Simon Liu, is serving as acting administrator for the Agriculture Research Service. Dr. Spira Stefano is the administrator for the Economic Research Service. Mr. Hubert Hamer is the administrator of the National Agriculture Statistics Service. And Dr. Dion Toombs is serving as acting director for the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and is also the new associate director for NIFA programs. And so we're so happy to have all of those leaders on board. And we also have Ms. Holly Wiggins, who's serving as the acting director of the Office of the Chief Scientist. So lots of acting roles here. And what I want to say to each of them right now is thank you for being willing to step up and help us during this transition. 
Also part of our REE leadership team is Dr. Sharon Drum, who you might know as ARS's chief of staff for many years. She has joined my team as REE senior advisor, and Mr. Brian Norton has joined my team as acting chief of staff for REE. Brian Norton is the director of our Office of International Research and Engagement, and so we are so happy to have them with us as well. So we have a talented and skilled um, leadership team in place at REE, and we are thrilled to work with partners like Congress and NCFAR to feed our nation through sound science and innovation. Now I'll move into some of our current priorities. REE's focus continues to build and strengthen our research capacity to help achieve the administration's and the secretary's priorities for USDA, addressing climate change through smart agriculture and forestry, advancing justice, equity, and inclusion within the agricultural community, creating more and better markets, enhancing food nutrition and reducing food insecurity, and making the USDA an even better place to work by supporting workforce development and encouraging the next generation of workers and diversifying our workforce. The work we do in REE is an integral part of these priorities and scientific research intersects all of them. Next slide, please. In addition to supporting the president's and secretary's work, we have some additional priorities for REE, including precision nutrition, particularly in the support of the president's Cancer Moonshot 2.0, science and infrastructure and innovation, and engagement and collaboration. And I am so excited to bring these priorities to bear and have such a strong team supporting each one of them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So an area, Sarah, you'll be excited about this one that I am so passionate about, and we've begun to work in this area is precision nutrition and the impact we can have on health and well-being with these tools. This hits home for me personally, not just because of my family and our history, but because of the communities I belong to and, su and the suffering I've seen them go through. You see, we know that people respond differently to food, depending on many factors, including age, sex, and ethnicity. Now we're developing new programs that use precise nutrition, nutrition approaches to more effectively tailor the guidance we provide to specific subpopulations, including in underserved communities. The goal is to help everyone achieve the most successful health-related outcomes. So you'll be hearing more about these exciting programs in the near future. Next slide, please. For the first time in over 50 years, the White House will host a conference on hunger, nutrition, and health this September, September 28th, to bring people together to achieve the goal of ending hunger and reducing diet-related diseases in the U.S. by 2030, all while reducing disparities. A national federal strategy will be announced at the conference to catalyze the public and private sector to address the intersections between food, hunger, nutrition, and health. REE agencies play a key role in providing scientific research and data that underpin nutrition guidelines and programs for the U.S., including in underserved communities. The goal of the cancer moonshot is to reduce the cancer death rate by at least 50% over the next 25 years and improve the experience of people and their families living with as well as surviving cancer. USDA has a unique role to play in the cancer wound shock. Think about it. USDA science and nutrition delivery programs through food can prevent cancer. Others by necessity work to cure cancer once it develops. REE has considerable tools in our toolbox in this area. For example, USDA ARS human nutrition programs include studies with a unique focus on food-based strategies for health promotion and disease prevention, including cancer. USDA NIFA partners are identifying the underlying causes of diet-related cancers and developing culturally competent nutrition education to underserved communities. USDA ERS collects and analyzes data on relationships of food security and chronic diseases, including cancer. USDA is uniquely positioned for a systems-based approach for precision nutrition in communities that need improved health outcomes. This approach includes <clears throat> this approach includes and can include both scientific research and nutrition delivery programs, and these can be integrated together to increase the potential of using food and nutrition to prevent chronic diseases such as cancer. 
And we've established a website in USDA and perhaps we can share that website in the chat today. Uh, please, if you're interested, do visit that website and follow us on our goal and our initiative to help support the president's goal of reducing cancer as we know it. Next slide. To meet the vaccine challenges faced in agriculture and food today, world-class scientists must work in modernized ag science facilities with high quality and modernized information technology foundations and a motivated, high-powered, diverse next generation of ag professionals. REE's priorities in this area will center on next-gen education, diverse K-12 pipelines, new and modernized facilities, and partnerships between our nation's land-grant universities and USDA for modern IT. Next slide. Employees are REE's greatest asset. Ensuring REE is a great place to work is one of my top priorities. I believe that employees who are more satisfied with their jobs and are fully engaged are the most effective public servants. And as far as collaboration goes, I don't need to tell this group how important collaboration is to meeting the incredible challenges that we are facing in agriculture. REE puts a premium on public-private partnerships and our partnership with NCFAR is one of them. We look forward to our continued partnerships with your organization as we work together to demonstrate the value of agriculture to the American people. In addition to this great partnership, over the next couple of years, you will see an increased emphasis in REE on partnering with tribal and minority serving institutions in the land grant community, as well as an emphasis across the broader communities we serve in USDA. USDA received investments as a part of three historic key pieces of legislation. So thank you to our congressional colleagues on the call today uh, for your support. The American Rescue Plan. The American Rescue Plan was enacted in response to the pandemic. It was a responsive way of delivering direct relief to the American people, rescuing the American economy and starting to beat, um, to beat the, I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, and starting to beat the virus. As a part of the plan for USDA, continues to be delivering nutrition assistance to millions of food insecure Americans. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, another name for the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is a historic investment in America that would change people's lives for the better and get America moving again. As a part of this investment, a bioproduct pilot program was established that provides $5 million each in fiscal years 2022 and 2023 for a total of $10 million to support work using agricultural commodities to manufacturing construction and consumer projects. The Landmark Inflation Reduction Act provides USDA with nearly $40 billion to invest over the next 10 years to improve life and livelihoods in rural communities. As part of this investment, USDA is committed to advancing equity through its policies and programs. We seek to improve access to programs and services for historically underserved producers, landowners, and operators. By centering equity in our decision-making and policy-making, USDA seeks to root out generations of systemic racism, sexism, and oppression to ensure equitable access across USDA programs for all of our customers. Under the leadership of Secretary Vilsack and Deputy Secretary Bernal, USDA is committed to turning the tide and realizing lasting change. And with that, I will turn the floor. I thank you for your attention and I will turn the floor to Dr. Simon Liu, who is the Acting Administrator for the Agriculture Research Service. Previous to his acting role, Simon has served as the Associate Administrator for ARS and um, is my by one of my great colleagues. And so Dr. Liu, you have the floor. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jacob Xiang. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give a quick general overview of ARS and our latest priorities. So ARS is USDA Chief Scientific In-House Research Agency. So our job is to finding solutions to agricultural problems that affect Americans every day from field to table. So here are a few examples to illustrate the scope of our agency. Currently, we have uh, about 600 research projects in four different major areas that include animal production protection, crop production protections, uh, nutrition, food safety, and quality, 
and also nature resources and sustainable ag systems. We have roughly about 8,000 strong employees, including 2,000 scientists and postdoctors, and additional 6,000 supporting staff. Our FY22 budget is 1.63 billion. So we conduct research in 93 uh, 90 plus locations around the country and three overseas laboratories. One thing I'd like to emphasize is that one third of our research locations are co-located with Lane Grain University. So our mission is simple, is to deliver scientific solutions to na national and global agriculture challenges. Our vision is clear. We have to be a global leader in agriculture discovery through scientific excellence. So to, to deliver our missions and realize our vision, we are working on many, many different areas and priorities due to the time limitation, I will focus on a couple of major areas. The first one is in align with RE USDA mission is to build a state of the art research environment to make ARS the best place to work. So that includes first, we have to continue to build a diverse workforce. We continue to recruit, retrain and retain our people with an emphasis on the minority to build a first class, diverse, equitable and inclusive workforce. Second, the modernized physical research infrastructure. We are modernizing our building and facility in the past many years. Uh, currently, our average age of our building is about 50 years old. We organize our facility research project into 118 projects. 27 of them has been funded by the Congress and we still have 91 to go. The next one is uh, building a state-of-the-art cyber infrastructure in addition to physical infrastructure. As you know that modern resource paradigm is data intensive, computational intensive and uh, collaborated oriented, collaboration oriented. So we have built and continue to expand our cyber infrastructure that leverage advanced sensors, equipment to collect and generate data and high performance computers uh, to enable high speed scientific computing and AI center of excellence and others to advance research and speed up scientific discoveries. So the second thing I'd like to uh, emphasize is that we uh, would like to conduct innovative research to continue to push the envelope to explore the new frontiers. So I'm going to give you two examples. The first one is a precision nutrition to support President's cancer Musha, as Dr. Jacob Young just mentioned earlier. So I'm going to move on to the second project we have focused on, which is a new climate smart cropping system for corn. So the project is to convert current corn production system to an overwintering system that recycle nitrogen and other fertilizers. So the new system will be more cost effective and environmentally sustainable. More specifically, we have to simplify farmers of their logistic, increase the yield, decrease the input, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, reduce the water pollution, and reduce other environmental footprint. So those are the quick high-level overview of ARS. Now I'd like to turn over to Dr. Spiro Stefano, the ERS administrator. Dr. Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Liu. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm Spiro Stefano, ERS administrator, and I'm happy to be here today. The Economic Research Service is one of the 13 federal statistical agencies, along with our sister agency at NAS. And our goal is to provide trusted, objective, timely research and statistics to inform public and private decision makers. Our it level, our activities exactly coincide with the NCFAR issues on food, ag, nutrition, conservation, and natural resources. And hopefully I'll get to tell you a little bit about that. We are a data and evidence building agency that's conducting independent research and analysis, on the economics, looking at the vitality of agriculture, food, the environment, and rural America. Now, we have three core assets. 
that we, we think of here at the Economic Research Service. First are our people and the expertise they bring to the agency. We have about 300 staff, uh, approaching 300 staff on board. 75% of those folks are economists and social scientists. The rest are mission supporting staff. Our data are another core asset. Uh, we have over 80 publicly available data and several protected data products that cover the range of agriculture, food, the environment, as well as rural America. And the third key asset are our core models. And these models cover the food landscape, such as the Food Access Research Atlas, what we, we, we used to call the Food Desert Map, uh, natural resources and the environment, uh, data uh, core models on land use, uh, looking at climate change, and markets and trade, which look at impact of climate change on land use and international trade markets. Uh, we have the food security uh, models that we use. Uh, that was, we were talking about food security a few moments ago. This month is almost food security month for us. Uh, we had earlier this month, we released the household food security report for domestic uh, situation here in the US. And next week we'll be releasing our international food security assessment that's covering 76 nations around the world that are food insecure and what their status is and the projected trends. So we have a number of these different products in place. So as I mentioned, our research covers a range of topics and we see these all as challenges. We looking at the challenge of feeding a growing world population. Food prices is at the forefront of everyone's agenda these days. And so it's, but food prices also have to relate to access and nutrition. And we've done some powerful work to support the Thrifty Food Plan, uh, the work to find how much the 50, the, the uh, plus up in the 50 food plan uh, had to be to keep folks, uh, keep those households at the similar level of nutritional security. Uh, that was work that we did to support uh, the Food Nutrition Service. Rural development, looking at the vitality of rural communities, not just with employment, the impact of COVID on, the, on these rural communities. And how did COVID transmit for, uh, from urban areas to rural areas? And what, what kind of lessons can we learn with the tr transmission of uh, such a pandemic? coming in the future. Uh, trade is a huge issue, of course. We see trade move, moving in a different direction these days, whereas we start to think of sustainability and will future trade agreements uh, have a sustainability component into them and how that can affect trade patterns moving forward. Russia-Ukraine conflict is a clear case in point. Uh, and the, the trade disruptions that are going on there and how's that impacting food insecurity worldwide. And you'll hear about that next week in a, in a webinar and looking at our report that will be released. Uh, of course, we're interested in foreign policy. The foreign bill is gonna be top of mind as well for many folks. And we're standing up a team to kind of digest what the proposals are and to try to provide some of that economic intelligence and informing information to policymakers and to private uh, stakeholders as well. Uh, adaptation to climate change. What is the impact of climate change? Climate change is a local, global, local challenge. Happens locally, has global consequences, but again, comes back to local outcomes. And we've been seeing that in the news a lot in the last couple of weeks. Talking about our data and foundational models, data is our second largest item in our budget. We invest a lot in data products across all the areas uh, that we mentioned in terms of food, uh, food nutrition, uh, rural economics, resource economics areas, and as well as trade and markets. So we try to integrate these commodities into an information system 
We have farm income reports that we do that track the state and vitality of farm households, financial vitality. Uh, three, times a, three times a year, we had a release earlier this month on the state of the farm household economy. And we're looking at the consumer and food industry data system. So a number of these different themes are at top of mind that are on our agenda. The Economic Research Service is the preeminent economic research agency in agricultural economics. There is no other agency in the world that has as many agricultural economists studying the same, studying these topics. And uh, we take that responsibility very seriously and we work actively to be at the forefront of our, of our profession and the economic intelligence that we can provide. Uh, with that, I will close and pass it on to my colleague, Administrator Hubert Hamer to talk about the National Agricultural Statistics Service. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sure, sure, I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Hubert Hamer again, the administrator of the National Agricultural Statistics Service. And uh, NAS is the USDA's data collection arm. We collect information directly from farmers and ranchers and agribusinesses. Our mission is to provide timely, accurate, and useful statistics in service to US agriculture. So how do we do that? Uh, we disseminate about 450 reports on an annual basis with information on crops, livestock, economic, and environmental statistics. Uh, we're one of the smaller agencies in the department. Uh, we have about 825 federal employees and 3,000 contract employees that help us with the data collection activity, multiple modes uh, for collecting information. And uh, our job is to uh, provide that information that's used across the department and across uh, in, uh, or basically for any data users. Uh, I wanted to uh, share a little bit of information on a quick update on a couple of activity items. Uh, we always enjoy working with different organizations and partnering, uh, look for opportunities to leverage our resources. Uh, we have teamed up with NASA to develop a crop condition and soil moisture analytics tool called CropCasma. This is a web-based application uh, that remotely senses geospatial soil and moisture uh, data and vegetative index data. Now producers are able to access this tool to monitor US soil and crop vegetation conditions. In addition to that, we're using that data as part of our weekly crop progress and crop condition report. Uh, another item I wanted to highlight is that NAS is in the process of updating our infrastructure as well, uh, looking to modernize our, our IT infrastructure uh, for the purpose of improving customer service, improving access to data. And again, we're working with several legacy systems and over the next three years or so, we will invest in that uh, infrastructure to be able to carry on with our operational programs, to support the 2027 Census of Agriculture, 2027 Census of Agriculture as well. Uh, we're looking to invest between 60 and $70 million over the next uh, few years. I also uh, wanted to highlight um, uh, that uh, we are preparing at this time for the Census of Agriculture. Uh, this is our flagship data collection activity where we collect information for more than 3,000 counties, parishes, and boroughs across the United States. This is a really big deal for us. I mean, these data have not been updated since 2017. Uh, so we're gonna do a complete count of every farm and ranch in the United States, uh, not just what is being produced, but the, we also have very um, uh, uh, dynamic information on who's actually producing uh, these particular commodities. What are the contributions of women? Uh, what are the contributions of veterans? Uh, so we'll have some uh, very important uh, uh, information that we can share in that regard. I wanted to say a little bit about the schedule of activity for that. We're gonna kick it off with online data collection in November. Paper questionnaires will be mailed out in December. And uh, we expect to have these data published uh, in uh, February of 2024. Well, how can you help us? Uh, we need all the help we can get 
promoting the census of agriculture. Again, these are data that will be used uh, to uh, establish farm policy. Uh, you can think about the farm bill used extensively by researchers. So it's a great opportunity for us all to partner and to uh, uh, get behind this effort. The other item I wanted to mention very quickly is if you're in the DC area, uh, I would invite you to participate in our lockup activities uh, where we release, release some of our principal federal economic indicator reports. These are the market sensitive reports that we have to basically have a full physical perimeter around the release of these reports. You can think about it in terms of a SCIF, uh, where all of the staff will go in and release those uh, reports at a scheduled uh, point in time. Uh, so uh, just happy to be with you today. Look forward to your questions. Uh, and I will turn it over to Dr. Toombs to give a NIFA update, Dr. Toombs. Thank you, Mr. Hamer. And it is truly exciting to be here with you today and for most of you who may not know, for some of you who may not know, uh, be familiar with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. We are the extramural research funding agency at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And Congress has entrusted us with more than 70 funding programs, totaling almost $2 billion. We provide funding mainly through capacity or formula and competitive grant programs. Our capacity programs provide research and cooperative extension funding for all land grant universities, including 19 historically black colleges and universities designated as 1890 land grants and also tribal colleges designated as land grants in 1994. Through these programs, we reach every community in the nation and non-formal hands-on education for farmers, producers, consumers, and families through the cooperative extension system. Extension emphasizes taking knowledge gained through research and education and bringing it directly to the people to create positive changes. They serve agriculture producers, urban gardeners, small business owners, consumers, families, and through 4-H to our youth who will be our next generation of agriculture leaders. Capacity funding to land grant universities also provides geographically specific agriculture research nationwide. And they also ensure that rural communities have the locally specific research that they need to remain competitive and that they can produce and deliver new knowledge focused on food, water, energy, and climate nexus to achieve healthy environments, ecosystems, and economies, both domestically and internationally. Our competitive grants portfolio is anchored by the Agriculture, Food, and Research Initiative, also known as AFRI. And AFRI supports every aspect of agriculture science from foundation to applied and social science. AFRI's funding has grown from 201.5 million in fiscal year two, 2009 and to 455 million in 2022. And the president's 23 budget request includes 564 million for AFRI. Now the flexibility of AFRI helps us quickly address the current needs of the nation. In the face of the global pandemic, NIFA created COVID rapid release response funding opportunity through AFRI to speed research results needed during the pandemic. This year, we use that model to enhance programs with what you've heard already from Dr. Jacob Young about the American Rescue Plan funding. The team of nearly 300 plus experts at the National Institute of Agriculture are dedicated to serving agriculture through research, education, and extension across all communities, benefiting all ages of people who call America home. Thank you. So Dr. Toombs is our final speaker for um, this session. I see we have two questions in the chat. Sarah, should we go to the question and answers? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the first question I'll read is, says the president's executive order on advancing biotechnology and biomanufacturing includes a data initiative. How do you see USDA participating in this initiative? For example, what agricultural data, bioproduct data, and or collections data have a place among the bioeconomy data? And how might you envision that coming together? Well, so, so we're perfectly positioned um, to the writer of the question. We've been um, operating in the data space and open access and data management for quite some time. And I'm going to turn the floor to Dr. Simon Liu, who's had a huge uh, leadership role in this because prior to his service in the administrator's office, he headed the National Agricultural Library, where we have some very exciting initiatives. So Dr. Liu, you want to talk a little bit about how we're looking at data and all of the data that we're, we're handling these days. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Jacob Chiang. So now AIS and OE, we have been working on the so-called open access since uh, I would say almost 10 years ago. Uh, so there are two major components of uh, open access. One is the open access to scholarly publication. So any kind of paper produced, by the USDA employee and the research data associated with that will be available. So the first system we have is a pop ad that's a really a house of all the publications, scholarly publications synchronized with the pub publisher, their, uh, their publications. The second piece is the ad data common. Uh, this is the, uh, the place that uh, we house all these the research data that associate with the uh, agricultural research uh, paper. So I would say that uh, at data comment right now, we have many, many data set uh, with the input from within the USDA, but also from the, uh, some of the, the land grant universities and other uh, our partners in the industry. So yes, indeed, uh, we do have uh, the facility, we have, do have the cap capability to facilitate any kind of open access to biotechnology data or any agricultural data. Thank you. Yeah, and we will work very closely with the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, in support of this EO as well as the several other exciting EOs that have been um, signed. And so we're very excited that we, we started on infrastructure for this a long time ago, so we are ready. Great. Yeah, we've had a, another question that I have here with me that actually does touch on the OSTP memo about um, open access and public access for all government funded research. And the question is wondering about uh, stakeholder involvement in development of USDA's public access plan. Dr. Lou, you want to take that one? Yes, uh, we published the USDA public access plan back in 2014. And since then, uh, we have uh, been through several iterations to reflect uh, the latest development. So as you know, that OSDP issued a new public access policy the memo uh, just a couple months ago. And this memo really uh, gave us uh, another, another push to continue to involve, involve our public access, the policy and also the system and then also the capacity. So as you know that OSTP, when they do the policy, they involve with uh, the stakeholders in the industry, in the publishing industry. So everybody got an input into the policy. So right now we are in a position to begin to uh, revise our plan to implement the new policy. Thank you. Right, and we look forward to working with the NCFAR and others if, if, if opportunities arise to continue to have input to the implementation, we have been sure that we um, include you all in the loop on that. Wonderful, thank you. I'm sure there's many NCFAR individual organizations and NCFAR as a whole who would love to help you guys with each of these initiatives you're working on. And our next question I'll direct to Dr. Toombs. Um, Ever since NIFA had relocated to St. Louis, if you could tell us about how that process is going. I know that you guys have worked very hard and have uh, you know, almost gotten back to full capacity. 
Yes, Sarah, you actually answered part of that question because we are 84 percent um, to that to our goal. And we have 323 employees at this present time. And so the question around, okay, how, how are we doing? We're doing great. We're in a good space. We are training, of course, when we have 84% of new staff, basically, you know, we're in the process of training our employees as well as training the stakeholders that we work with in order to ensure that we have that uh, partnership and engagement of learning of what we're both doing in order to achieve the mission of the agency as a whole. Wonderful. Yeah, it's great to, to see things come together. Yeah. And Sarah, I'll also add that ERS certainly is in a great shape as well. And so we've been very proud of oh. the work of all of the teams. Um, as you may know, the Agriculture Research Service does all of the hiring for REE. And so we don't have a big team, but we have a mighty team. And it really does take all of the uh, team members within the agencies and our HR teams to be able to get this done. And so in the same time they were hiring for ERS and NIFA, uh, ARS in one year hired 1800 people. So, so I wanna say hats off to all the human resource professionals in America right now, because without them, I just don't know where we would be right now. And so um, I'm just so proud of the teams that have been built in ERS and NEF. And I know that with Spiro and Dion's leadership, we're, 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 we're off to a great start. Wonderful. Yeah, that, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> if, if I can add just a, a little bit more color. I also, I second Dr. Jacobs Young applauds to the, our human resources team. Uh, it was all done during a pandemic as well. So bringing on all these folks for us and for ERS and NIFA and the remote status, you know, that was a massive challenge. And, and our facilities in Kansas City, Missouri, not St. Yeah. Louis. <laughs> it's a beautiful facility, state of the art. Um, so you know, we welcome folks to come visit there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. Sorry about that. <laughs> and we've had another question and I encourage all our participants, if you still have questions, there's still a little bit of time. So please do type those into the Q&A box uh, while we're addressing our next question. Um, and so this might be for each of the administrators or Dr. Jacob Chung, but if you could talk a little bit about the programs you have available for students, um, fellowships, internships, and things of that nature. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let the administrators um, answer this because we, we're, all, we're all operating in this space. How about we start with Administrator Hamer? Okay, technology here. Uh, we're always hiring. Uh, we're looking for new talent to bring into the organization. Uh, obviously, the portal is to go to OPM, uh, to the website, uh, uh, .gov, uh, to, uh, to, be, uh, to see, look for the uh, particular announcements. Uh, but we're looking for primarily agricultural statisticians, mathematical statisticians, and information technology specialists. Those are the three primary disciplines that we hire in, and uh, we're open for business and looking for talented students who are available and looking for opportunities uh, at USDA NAS. Uh, Dr. Liu. Yeah, so within AIS, we do have a few programs. The first one, uh, is the 1890 National Scholar Program. Uh, the idea is that to sponsor the student in those uh, eight, nine, 19, uh, eight, 19 uh, university, the 1890 university. So uh, we, each university we have sponsored at currently two National Scholar to do so. And we also have uh, the pilot program with other language university focus on the AI and the big data. And so the goal is to bring uh, those students into our lab, let them know uh, what we do. Really, our goal is that to make sure that people know that AIS is an exciting and advanced research organization. So uh, this is the AI uh, Big Data uh, pilot project with uh, 
course, the university is very, very critical for us to continue to build up our, our capacity in advanced technology area. So we also have um, uh, postdoc, other postdoc program go, going through the all rise. Uh, those postdoc uh, program will be able to include the international postdocs on an annual basis. We hire hundreds of postdocs. So those are the great opportunities. So go to ORI's website and you will find currently we have roughly about 100 opening over there. Yeah, Thank so you. please send your students our way. We want them. Spiro, you have some exciting work underway working with our, our future leaders. Yep, so well, we too participate in 1890 Scholars Program. We, we support about four students right now. Uh, and we also have a program at the Farm Foundation, an Ag Scholars Program, where we're funding 15 students for the, over the course of the year to kind of learn about the, the ag economy and, and the system that it operates in. And we've now bumped that up to add to 20 to have five targeted or underrepresented groups at, coming from minority serving institutions. We participate in the Pathways Program as well. We just don't take economists. You know, we, we have uh, communication specialists, communication majors coming to us, public policy majors, geography with geospatial information. And right now we're engaging in a new program, a uh, special uh, endeavor with the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association, try to build the next generation of scholars here in the area of agricultural economics for graduate program preparation. Uh, but as well as the, the pipeline coming up to that to that group. And so we, we need that pipeline filled and we, we want to help our institutions here, our higher education institutions, make that happen. They're the ones who decide who gets into a program, what they do in their program, who gets out. We're trying to help them make that transition to really promote underrepresented groups that have a higher profile and higher presence in, our, in that pool. Yes, and, and, and Nip, I saved you for last because, and Dion, just let's give us a high level because you guys have so much going on. Okay, high level. Um, we have a lot of the cross-cutting programs like they do across the entire USDA from the 1890 Scholars Program, as well as the Pathways Program. And we have our fellows uh, program as well. So those who are interested in almost everything in agriculture could fit into NIFA. You know, even if it's ag business, we have our Office of Grants and Management, we have a policy side, we have all of the programs around animal health, uh, plant health, uh, nutrition, food safety. So, you know, you name it, just give us a call. You know, we can further assist you as well. But going to USA Jobs uh, is also helpful to finding out about all the programs across USDA. Wonderful. Thank you. And at this time, I don't see any other questions. So unless anybody wants to type in a last minute question here in our last few minutes, I wanna take this time to thank each of our USDA REE leaders for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us and share these updates, which is super informative. And I can't thank you enough for, you know, you guys have so much on your plates clearly, and we really appreciate all that you're doing to lead the agricultural research uh, endeavors. So with that, I think we'll, we'll close out our webinar for today. Thank you all. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Josh Stoll, our Senior Advisor for Legislative Affairs, which I forgot to acknowledge him. But thank you, Josh, for your support this morning too. And thank you, Laura, and everybody for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.